Good morning, everybody. How are you? 8.30, bright and early. Okay. I, <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, I appreciate everybody showing up for the, um, for the uh, CLE we're going to present today. Um, I, I figured I'd introduce myself a bit, take a little poll as to how many of you are familiar with at all with the subject matter, because it, that will uh, uh, shape how, how we do this. I could probably stand here and talk to you until 5 o'clock about all of this stuff. So we're going to try, not that that's going to happen. Um, I understand everybody else has things to do. So I'm going to try to keep it as concise as possible. But um, so uh, a little bit about me. My name is Christopher Reynolds. I'm an attorney at Vashon & Rich. I've been with the firm in one capacity or another for 11 or 12 years. Uh, I started when I was still in law school, and I've been at, now I'm in my 10th year of practice. Prior to coming to the law, I was a clinical social worker. So I have a master's in clinical social work and a bachelor's in psych. So I have a unique, I think, um, take on some of the issues that we end up dealing with in the DR world. Anybody here familiar with the DR world at all? One person. OK. So whether you agree with it or not, I refer to it as the gutter. Because um, <clears throat> a lot of times that's what it is. We end up functioning more like social workers or highly paid babysitters or parents than we are actually as lawyers. So in the very somewhat um, odd uh, uh, sense, I find this area of law very exciting because it's one area of law in practicing domestic relations that makes you feel like a lawyer, <laughs> like an actual lawyer. Um, so uh, anybody here familiar with the 1980 Hague Convention on International, the civil aspects of international child abduction, other than maybe having heard of it? Just a little bit. Everybody heard of Daniel Goldman, the famous Brazil case where the dad was trying for years and years to get his son back. That's usually where most people have heard of it. Um, to that end, I think what we should probably do is start off a little bit talking about giving you just a general overview of what the convention is and what it's supposed to do. Um, because that's going to inform what we're talking about as far as the majority of the presentation, which is really one way of looking at, a critical way of looking at whether or not we as a society in the United States are living up to our global obligations underneath this international treaty. So um, the basis of what I'm going to be talking about today derives functionally out of two articles that we published, our office, several of us, several of the lawyers in our office published. Um, one through Oxford University Press and one through the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers. If you hadn't signed up at the beginning, if you want copies of those articles, I'm happy to email them to you. Some of them are a little bit thick, so rather than killing trees, I figured PDFs would be better. So if you didn't sign up and you want them, just give me your email address and I'll have a mass email sent out with, with PDFs of those as well if you care to read them. <clears throat> so essentially what we're talking about today is what I would consider a rather jarring suggestion is that the United States is in some respects a refugee state for abducted children, even though we see ourselves as this beacon of enlightenment legally, um, culturally within the world, um, truth, justice in the American way. But the statistics seem to suggest that that's not always the case. So famous, somewhat famous quote from James Baker, America's right even when we're wrong. <laughs> okay. uh, I don't mean to be overly critical of the United States, but it's easy to pick on ourselves rather than other people. And actually, I have some comments that will update some of the slides that, that we have. Um, and my personal editorial commentary on reading between the lines as to why we don't have a whole lot of statistics going forward, at least as far as I can find, um, beyond 2013 as it relates to abductions to the United States. So um, as a primer, let's talk about the 1980 Hague Convention. The, the Hague Convention is often, well, there are a number of Hague Conventions. Many of you may be aware of different ones as it relates to international service process, discovery, 
uh, enforcement of um, uh, commercial paper, things of that nature. Um, they all rise out of Den Haag in the Netherlands. There is a, a, a sitting commission there that promulgates these uh, proposed conventions that are then ratified by nations, um, whether by member nations or then um, by non-member nations, which are essentially, they're acceded to, but they're in, essentially in, in force and effect. So this one was drafted in its final form in 1980. It was adopted by the United States in 1986 under President Reagan. So it's been in effect for functionally 31 years. In its essence, the Hague Convention, it, the, the formal name of it is the, the Hague, 1980 Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Parental Child Abduction. It was given that name specifically to sound scary. Okay? <laughs> Usually the image it evokes, at least for me, is somebody throwing a black hood over some kid's head under cover of night, throwing them in a van and stealing them away. Right? That's not generally what happens. It is usually much more, and I'll use this term loosely, benign. Um, it is largely parents. It doesn't have to be parents. It, doesn't, it isn't limited to parents, per se. Um, but it is essentially designed as a method for determining venue. At its heart, it is a forum selection mechanism. It sets up a set of priorities as it relates to which country, and we'll use the term state in that sense, in the convention, capital S, uh, has presumptive priority to make determinations on the merits of the underlying custody issues related to children, whether, that, whether they have been adjudicated before or not. So if what it's designed to do then is prevent a parent or some other person with rights of custody, there's a lot of terms of art in the convention, from crossing an international border with a child with the intent either at the time of crossing or after getting across then the intent to stay in order to gain essentially literally a home court advantage. So uh, I grew up north of Detroit, so for me the easiest um, analogy would be me crossing the Detroit River into Windsor, right? It's literally another country. <laughs> um, in order to gain an advantage, because I'm a Canadian citizen, I am not, but if I were to gain an advantage in the Canadian court systems as it relates to a child. Whether or not the convention applies at all boils down to, is the child under age 16? Once you hit age 16, even during pending, juristic, pending litigation, poof, it's gone. The claim's gone, the convention doesn't apply, everything evaporates. In effect, <clears throat> that is exactly what happened in the very first case that made it finally to the United States Supreme Court in 2010, Abbott v. Abbott, that the child actually aged out of the application of the convention while the case was pending before the United States Supreme Court. So in that case, the father won, but he lost. Um, so the way the convention works is, is that if you are a person with a right of custody, and that is determined by this very nebulous term called habitual residence. Habitual residence is, in effect, the place where the child has lived factually long enough for them to have a connectivity to that place. In the United States, it's viewed from the vantage point of the child. So if you have a six-year-old child who's lived six years of their lives in Germany, and all they know is, when I go to school, I go to this German school. When I go to the doctor, I go to this doctor, whatever. That is the child's habitual residence. It is a factual determination. It is not necessarily limited by time. And it is not defined by the convention at all, anywhere. <laughs> it's defined in the negative to the extent that it is not equivalent to domicile. So it can't be changed by saying, I intend to live there. All right? Um, so a lot of litigation that comes up around the Hague Convention is, is, uh, tends to fall along these undefined terms, habitual residence. One that a lot of the, the, the case law that you see is one that we're not going to get into, which is grave risk of harm, which is one of the defenses to a return under the convention. But the idea is, is that if a parent or person with a right of custody under the laws of the state of habitual residence, they have a right of custody, 
And the only one that's defined by the convention is, as an example, literally, is the right to determine where the child resides. There's all sorts of other ones. They can be defined by the, the internal laws of the habitual residence. And the removal or the retention of the child beyond outside of that habitual residence violates that right. It's considered wrongful. It's not criminal, necessarily, at least under the convention. But it's considered wrongful. What does wrongful mean? It means that if there's a right of custody, that arose under the habitual residence of the child, and that right was violated, therefore re rendering the removal or retention wrongful, the state to which, in which the child is found, assuming it's a signatory, is obligated to return the child to the habitual residence. It doesn't make a determination on the merits of the underlying custody action. It's not supposed to. But that's the mechanism. Essentially, we're not touching the merits, you're going back to Germany, let Germany figure it out. We have an analog in the United States for our person who has some foray into the swamp, which is called the UCCJEA, Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction and Enforcement Act. It functions the same way, more or less. It essentially says which state has first priority to make determinations about a child's custody. So. That's essentially what we're talking about when we're talking about the Hague Convention. Most scholars, practitioners will tell you that the most important aspect of the Hague Convention is the return mechanism, which is really what everybody's after. My child was stolen from me to X. I want them back. And that's where this is all talking about. But when we boil it down as lawyers, what we're really talking about is forum, <laughs> which is at the very beginning of litigation, right? Are we in the right place? not even dealing with the merits. So people can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and years of their life and the emotional energy and the time commitment just to get to the beginning of the case. So that's why this is an important issue to me, I think to all of us, but that's essentially what the Hague Convention is designed to do. It also has some, pro some provisions about rights of access, meaning if your child's in another place and one parent gives you the finger and says you're not talking to your daughter, can you ask for assistance in making sure that that contact happens? There are provisions for that. They are litigated much less. All the activity that we generally tend to see on the, on the uh, at least on the case law side, um, has to do with the abduction part, abduction retention, we use them interchangeably, but really sending the kid back to where they quote should be. <clears throat> so, going back to the, the issue at hand, there are some practical and legal impediments in international and domestic laws, as well as the practical aspects of family law courts in the United States, and I can speak specifically in Ohio, that make it very difficult for what we call the left behind parent, wherever they are. Could be mom, could be dad. I've represented both. I'm currently representing both. Um, about having his or her child returned from the U.S. to the country of habitual residence. And this, there's some statistics that arise out of, again, I'll tell you where they come from in the convention, concerning children abducted to the U.S. and that suggest that children suggest bleh, that their abductions, the p child's potential for a return are insufficient. And they represent, and only a small, even those reported cases represent only a small fraction of the cases that are actually reported to the agency that is responsible for maintaining those statistics. So we have a very, one, just generally very narrow sample set because of the small size of, of the issues at hand, right? These aren't like widespread cases like just general divorce cases, for example, or child custody cases. But then we have an even smaller subset because we're limited, the data is limited by who reports it. Okay. <clears throat> so under the convention, a couple of other things. Um, every country that is a signatory or who has acceded to the convention has required to set up what's called a central authority. 
It can be any governmental agency. It can actually be um, delegated to a non-governmental agency. But essentially, it's the point person within the country that is supposed to handle and coordinate requests for return or access. They are obligated to have one. In the United States, it's the State Department. Surprise, surprise. In other countries, sometimes it's the um, Ministry of Justice. It could be a separately designated agency all unto itself. But there is some governmental or governmentally appointed agency that says, hey, if you want to make a, a claim for a return, you can file one with us. Right? And parents can directly file a claim for a return under the convention with the United States State Department. The office is called the Office of Children's Issues. It used to be administered by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They're still involved, but they're not formally the, the central authority anymore. The central authority is also required to report to Congress, you can get these reports online and we'll talk about them a little bit, of the statistics that they get about incoming and outgoing requests. So requests that are filed with the central authority in the United States for children abducted from and the incoming ones. So as I mentioned a moment ago, part of the problem is the statistics that the State Department is, is compiling is based upon those cases that are reported to it, whether they get them directly or if a case is filed, and we'll I'll talk about that in a second, the State Department usually gets notice that there has been an action commenced pursuant to the federal statute, the, enact, the uh, enabling statute under the convention, which is there's two of them. They've both just recently been um, renumbered, recategorized. They used to be in section in Title 42. They're now in Title 22. Um, it's 22 USC Section 9001 at SEC. And they're known as ICARA in ICAPRA, the International Child Abductions Remedies Act and the International Child Abduction Prevention and Remedies Act. The Prevention and Remedies Act is otherwise known as the David Goldman Act. It came about after the whole David and Daniel Goldman issue. Um, so, moving forward, on to the statistics. Three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> right? Our good friend Mark Twain. So, when we consider... The statistics that the last set of statistics that I can find as it relates to the United States came from the Office of Children's Issues in 2013. It's the only year that we can find in which this, the central authority actually disclosed statistics about children being abducted to the United States. Since then, because the ICAPRA, the Daniel Goldman, legislation took effect in 2014, I'm in a bit of a cynic, the focus of the reporting of statistics has shifted. Now the focus of the statistics is on children who have been taken from the United States and who are the bad guys out there who aren't doing their job under the convention and how bad are they doing it, meaning countries. So in 2013, the OCI reported 487 cases brought under the Hague Convention that closed. Okay, now the term under the new reporting is resolved. And I'll tell you a bit about that in a second. The closed then meant that it was either a court disposition, the, the child was voluntarily returned, there was a failure to prosecute, the case just got dismissed, or the kid aged out. What does that tell you? What does it tell me? <laughs> okay. These cases that are resolved don't necessarily mean that the kid went back. <laughs> so the statistics are even smaller as the children who are actually returned. Right? Of those, only 222, 220 were actually ordered to be returned after a proceeding. And of the 90, 94 voluntary returns, only one went to back to a non-Hague country. I can't tell you exactly what country that is off the top of my head. My suspicion is, is it, it was probably one of the first world countries that had yet to sign on, and the most recent one was Japan. Um, Japan 
surprisingly, didn't become a member of the Hague Convention until April of 2014. Shocking to me, and I was in the middle of a case that should have been a Hague case at the time involving Japan. <clears throat> Since the, the, the Goldman statute went into effect, the 2014 report by the OCI reports that cases that have re resolved, resolved is defined primarily the same way, except it also talks about the fact that the left behind parent withdrew the application, so they just gave up. We don't know why. Could have run out of money. There's all sorts of reasons you could possibly imagine. They got pressured into it, right? Who knows? They couldn't find the left behind parent. So again, the failure to prosecute, but seems to raise another sort of implication that this person just kind of disappeared. Or that the left behind parent or the child died, not just that they aged out. So of the 781 cases that resolved outbound, they include all of those subsets. So we're not talking about real great success rates as far as the, the amount of children or cases that are resolved, at least from my perspective. Of those 781, you can look these up online if you just Google uh, ICAPRA um, report, it'll pop right up, okay, from the State Department. Um, 273 were to Mexico, 33 to Canada, 25 each to Germany and the UK, and the remaining 425 were to other. I don't even know who the others are some of which may have been to non-member non states. Um, but we're still talking about not too um, promising statistics. So when you look at the 2013 statistics, when we do the math, we're looking at about 46% of the children that are abducted to the United States were returned based on those statistics. Less than half. <clears throat> So put it another way, if you have a child that is abducted from their habitual residence that is outside the United States, you have less than a 50% chance of having your child returned. Aside from on the merits. And then that is a problem that's different from the number of children who are being judicially serviced. Okay? That, could be that just includes voluntary returns. So even the ones where you have to forcibly return children, take actions to forcibly return children. I think we may have already yeah, covered that. <clears throat> so again, just circling back some years prior, as far as the last year of incoming reported children, the numbers have gone up. They've continued to go up. If you look at um, just worldwide statistics, the amount of transnational movement not surprisingly, given the globalization of our, of our economy and our world, um, there's a lot of transnational movement. There's a lot more of these cases that are being reported, meaning they're ending up in the hands of the central authority or judicial system. Um, and, they've, and, and it's been a steady increase. It's been pretty much a straight line increase. And again, it's also important to, to realize that just cases, these are reported cases, right? It doesn't mean the number of children. One case does not equal one child. And in fact, there was one case that I know of for sure that was litigated in the Northern District of Ohio starting, well, it was resolved finally in the federal court in 2009 called Simcox that involved, I believe, five children related to Mexico. But that would represent one case. So aside from these statistics, what are the problems? Parents can file a convention claim by filing a petition for a return through the, the central authority, which would then not, in the United States, wouldn't directly take any action. They would then try to steer the parent to an attorney or to the appropriate court in order to take whatever action needs to be taken. They will and, and are required to take action to try to locate the child, try to massage along a resolution, but they're really not empowered in the United States to do much by way of forcibly 
having the child returned, having contact established, et cetera. So what happens? I'll give you a fact pattern. Wife comes to the United States with children. They had been living in Denmark, which is the husband's home country. Let's assume that they had been there for three years. Wife and children in the United States for over six months. I use that number very specifically because under the UCCJEA that I mentioned, once a child has been a resident of a state for at least six months, that state is considered the child's what we call home state, which is kind of the analog of habitual residence, meaning that state has sole, exclusive, primary jurisdiction to render custody determinations. So I files for divorce after she hits a six month mark. In Ohio, like a lot of states, there's also a residency requirement for filing a, a complaint for a divorce and that's six months as well. So once you cross that six month mark, boom, I can file. Serves husband in Denmark, husband hires an attorney in the United States. If his lawyer isn't familiar with all of this stuff, he just may advise him to file a counterclaim, fight for on custody, and treat it essentially as a relocation case. Not necessarily realizing that this is more a federal issue, a federal law issue, a forum issue, not a merits issue. <clears throat> Why is that a problem? Well, one, anybody who's ever known somebody or dealt with a divorce case knows that they can be sometimes painfully slow. Okay. In the United States, huh? As compared to other states? Yeah. <laughs> Um, Hague cases in general, even in the United States, tend to be painfully slow. So there's an inherent advantage in the way that the American legal system works just by default that is to the advantage of the abducting parent to the United States, whether it's being litigated in a state level court or a federal court. And just so you know, under ICARA, there's concurrent ju original jurisdiction in federal and state courts to hear Hague cases. In the other, well, I'll get to that in a second. So we have a very slow legal system. The one study that we found that was of some use on the statistics as it relates to average date or time to resolve a Hague matter it was from 2008 out of Cardiff. In the United States, it was an address of 207 days from the date the central authority got involved until it was sent to court. <sighs> it doesn't even address the time it gets to court to in order for a return or something else. So we're talking the better part of a year, right? a little over six months, just to get it from the central authority to a court. In other nations, average time, Finland, 75 days, Iceland, 73 days, Denmark, 44 days. Other countries are much better at getting it from the central authority to wherever it needs to go pretty quickly. Germany's really fast. I have a personal little vendetta with Germany because I think they overstep their bounds in some respects, but that's my own little editorial comment. Um, take that for us worth. Hopefully, we have no German nationals here who will be offended. I am German by heritage, too, so I can pick on myself. <laughs> um, I'm not trying to be critical of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the world entirely. We are not the best member of the treaty co-signers. We are also not the worst, but our statistics are unreliable. And what, we, what I'm saying is, is that we don't meet our own, we're not meeting our own standards and objectives as it relates to fast disposition of these cases as it's required by the convention. The convention itself says there's an, there's an inherent expectation that however the case is brought, whether it's to a central authority or to a judicial body or some other body, because in other, in other um, countries they can have administrative agencies that can process these things. It's a little antithetical to our, our system of, of law here, but it happens in other, in other places. Of 
from filing to resolution, six weeks. Right? So there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an expectation of expediency with these things for obvious reasons, at least to me. So the old adage that possession is nine-tenths of the law ends up really applying in the United States, that if you get your child here, and this is true in other countries as well, I can tell you right now I have a case that's dealing with South Africa, who adheres pretty functionally to that six-week mark. The date that we, that we had South African Council file a Hague, Hague petition, the judge wanted it heard, and it was filed in April and May. They're like, we're, we're doing this thing. And then they had to beg and claw to, to kind of push things back for various procedural reasons. But they want things done. They want to move them. They want them done. They want decisions made. The United States, we don't have that infrastructure. So the parent who has a possession, it becomes all the, the more difficult for the left behind parent to have the child returned. For example, I mentioned before Abbott v. Abbott, 2010, the first, uh, first Hague case to make it to the United States Supreme Court. Um, it was decided in 2010. It originated in 2005. So it took five years to get to the, to the Supremes. And essentially, it was it centered on the issue of defining what does habitual or what does right of custody mean. So the child thought to have the child returned to Chile after mom had taken the child, who had been granted sole custody under the Chilean courts, just up and took the kid to Texas. Um, he lost in the lower courts, finally gets to the U.S. Supreme Court. My personal editorial opinion is the reason the U.S. Supreme Court, I think, decided to take this case is I think it was their welcome gift to Justice Sotomayor um, because she was part of the litigation on the lower end. Um, they found that the father had a right of custody and that the convention had been violated, but at that point, the problem was it took so long that the child had aged out. Right? So we're seeing this, what we would all be painfully aware of in all civil litigation in the United States, it takes a long time. We have discovery delays. We have scheduling problems. We have crowded dockets. We, the wheels of justice grind slowly. But what happens when that hits real people, we have, we have these problems. So the United States should be aspiring to getting these cases done, where, however they're instituted, quickly, but we're not. So what do we do about that? Let me give you a fact pattern. Family moves to Ohio from a Hague signatory state for father's short-term work assignment. Mom presumes that the family would return to the home country, wherever that was, France, make up a country, after that, that habitual residence ends. Approximately 10 months after moving to Ohio, father says, eh, this isn't working. Maybe they're at Wright-Patterson down near Dayton. I want a divorce. Files for divorce down in Montgomery County. And mom's request to return the child to the home country is essentially treated as a relocation request. Okay, we talked about that before because of a lack of practitioner's familiarity with Hague's jurisdictional issues. There's an inherent problem with the blurred intersection between these Hague actions and state domestic relations law because even if you're trying to litigate a relocation case, it do, one doesn't um, one doesn't preclude the other. If you filed, if if the practitioner was aware of the jurisdictional pre prerequisite that the United States would have to show that it is the child's habitual residence before it continues on the merits, and in this case, mother loses, she can still bring the the relocation request in the substantive parenting action. The question is, do you give up that very powerful potential return uh, remedy by f just simply by failing to bring it and not being aware of it? <clears throat> Further, these cases aren't common. 
Judges aren't familiar with them. Okay, so we have the bar, and then you have the judges. So from, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say a personal friend of ours, but we have had a lot of contact with him, Jeremy Morley. He's a, uh, a very vocal Hague um, commentator out of New York. He's uh, British but lives in New York. He stated that it's more usual than not for a judge in a Hague case to have report that this is my first Hague case and then ask lawyers to help them understand what to do. They don't see these things. I had this happen just in, a year ago in the Northern District of Ohio. Judge said, this is my first time, my first rodeo. You guys are going to have to help me. In reported cases from dif specific districts that heard hate cases, such judges heard one or two cases. I had another case in the Northern District of Ohio in 2011 where the judge, I'm not going to give his name, considered himself an expert on hate cases because he had handled two in his career. Two. Our judges, and that's on the federal level, not even on the state level. We just, they just don't have the opportunity to see these types of cases. So they then tend to treat them like every other type of civil litigation. Some of them get it better than others and say, hey, look, this convention says we have to get this done fast. We're fast tracking it. It's supposed to take docket priority. We're setting a trial date. Practice pointer, you are not entitled to discovery in Hague cases. Okay? Um, a lot of the rules of evidence are, are, are relaxed. Anything that you attach to your petition for a return doesn't have to be authenticated, <laughs> including affidavits, including other materials. They can be decided on summary judgment. There's all U.S. case law supporting this in international case law as well. They are meant to be summary proceedings. The idea is we need to find out where this, the merits are to be decided quickly. Get the kid back there and be done with it. In the US, we don't treat them that way. We treat them much more delicately because we're unfamiliar with them, both as practitioners and from the bench. I don't want to make a mistake, so the process then further slows down. Are we doing out of time? <clears throat> the Hague Conference has a guide to good practice, which I believe everybody who Touches family law should at least take a look at, and judges should certainly take a look at it. It encourages all treaty partners to provide for a concentration of Hague return cases in a limited number of courts. A lot of states, meaning states, capital S, countries, do that. Germany, for instance, is one. They have a predefined court that deals only with Hague cases. That's what they do. It would be tantamount in uh, my world, in the DR world, where you have a, ma a single magistrate that all they do all day long is process domestic violence requests, right? emergency motions. The US has no such concentration. Even though a car allows concurrent jurisdiction in both federal and state courts. Even if the US assigned one judge in each judicial district to hear cases on a per capita basis, that judge would hear about two cases a year. Right. Now, that's obviously skewed. You'll have con higher concentrations in New York, Chicago, the coasts, Miami, other places. The Sixth Circuit, for some reason, seems, seems to see an inordinate amount of Hague cases. I'm not really sure why. I'm not sure that anybody has actually ever done any research as to why that is. I have my speculations, two of which are Wright-Patterson and Detroit, because the auto industry and the... Uh, the movement of um, manufacturing and engineering uh, people transnationally as, as things have continued to go that way. Daimler Chrysler, right? German company, you have a lot of influx going both ways. <clears throat> There's cost concerns for the left behind parent. These, these cases are not inexpensive. Attorneys experienced in Hague matters tend to have sophisticated family law practices. 
shameless plug. Okay. Um, they oftentimes will employ experts if you get discovery, which oftentimes you can do because, again, the judiciary doesn't want to screw it up. They'd rather err on the side of give me more information than less so I don't make a mistake. They really do treat these things with, in my experience, a level of, an appropriate level of um, concern because they all seem to understand that what they're dealing with is the life of a child and no matter what they decide, everybody's going to lose. Everybody. And this isn't an auto accident. This isn't a, a med mal case. This isn't an employment discrimination case. Everybody's going to lose and everybody's going to spend a diaper load of money to get there. There's travel costs for the left behind parent having to come to the jurisdiction and stay. The stakes are high. This is a zero sum game. And that's how parents treat it. It's a zero sum game. And then most of these cases, one, if there is um, a fast track, and even if there isn't, they're extremely time intensive. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in a very, very short period of time. What does that do? It furthers the problem that these cases aren't being processed quickly. We're not meeting our obligations under the international standards that we've adhered to or agreed to adhere to in processing these cases exp expeditiously. That translates into if you get your child back to the United States, you have a greater chance of wearing the other side out, elongating it through protracted litigation, aging the kid out, winning on appeal, getting a stay. There's all of these things that happen when our inherent judicial system and, and, and lack of familiarity with these issues um, kind of coalesce. I want to skip forward. I know we're running late on time. Um, this problem can be, you can look at, the, these materials are all, all provided in, in the handout that I gave you. Um, it speaks a little bit more to the UCCJEA aspect of this because when what I've been talking about now are cases where both countries are signatories, the United States and Canada, the United States and Mexico, the United States and South Africa, now the United States and Japan. But there was a case that I was involved in where, and I'll just give you the quick snippet, Child was six. Mom abducted the kid from Japan, flew to Guam, flew to Florida, bought a car, drove to Columbus. The kid had only lived in Japan. Mom was U.S. citizen. Dad was Japanese citizen. Kid was dual citizen. Citizenship doesn't really mean anything. Again, it's really all about where is that kid's connectivity, habitual residence. At the time, Japan was not a signatory. Right. Under a Hague analysis, we would have won like that. Kid only lived her life in Japan. Habitual residence is Japan. Japan says both parents share parental rights and responsibilities until a court says otherwise. Mom removed the kid from the jurisdiction without dad's consent. That violates his right of custody. And she has no valid defense. And there's only three of them. They're very, very narrow. I won't bore you with them right now. It would have been over and done. Not a signatory. What do we do? We came up with a proxy, and you, and you can read through it uh, in your materials, but essentially the UCCJEA functions a lot like the Hague Convention. It says, hey, which place is supposed to have super priority over making custody determinations? And in the Ohio version of it, which is 310704, 3107, I'm th 3127 is the UCCJEA, but 0 .04, the UCCJEA defines foreign countries as if they were states, United States. So what does that imply? It implies that there is a nexus between the two stat statutory structures. And that's what we used. So to give you the long and short of it was, dad found out where the child was. The child was abducted in July. He finds out late November, early December where she is, contacts us. 
beginning of January, five months after the kid was here. So remember under the UCCJEA, once the kid's here for six months, Ohio's the home state. We file a complaint to, for custody in Franklin County after the five month mark. Knowing full well what mom's gonna do. What's she gonna do once we say, I want custody? Anybody? Come on. Counterclaim, for what? I want custody, right? That's what we expect. And it's a compulsory counterclaim. When are you gonna bring it? After I win, <laughs> right? That's what we wanted. We wanted to provoke her counterclaim for custody. As soon as, as, soon as she found her, filed her counterclaim for custody, we, we challenged subject matter jurisdiction. Most people go like, what? We, you invoked jurisdiction by filing your complaint, waited for her counterclaim, and then we filed a motion to dismiss based on lack of subject matter jurisdiction under the UCCJEA, saying Ohio's not the home state. Japan is. And under the UCCJEA, you have to treat it like it's a state. So you, have, you can't do anything on the merits. You got to send the kid back. Problem, UCCJEA, there is no return provision. But there are other provisions. I'm going to flip through this real quick. Right? So they treat foreign nations as states, but they also have another provision that talks about unjustifiable conduct. If a parent brings a child from another state, even a foreign country, to this jurisdiction for the purposes of secreting the child, retaining the child, or restraining, or otherwise preventing the child from returning to the home state, the court shall decline to exercise its jurisdiction even if it has it. Okay? So we're saying don't do things when people do bad stuff. How can it be used to approximate a return? Just because the court doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction over the merits doesn't mean it's powerless. There's another section that says that the court can fashion an appropriate remedy to ensure the safety of the child. They can order the child be surrendered to the parent that is the left behind parent. They can make other orders and enforce them through contempt proceedings. Um, I know we're running out of time a bit, but in this case, this also highlights how terrible these cases can be when you have an uninformed bar and judiciary. Now, the convention itself didn't apply, but we were in Franklin County Juvie Court. Anybody ever been down there? Everybody been to Franklin County General Division? Nobody? Okay. It's like the Justice Center on steroids. Okay, I mean, it, 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 like a machine. It, things are just going all the time. And we end up before a magistrate. Who all she hears all day are pro se litigants coming in and fighting about why baby mommy or baby daddy didn't do this or do that, because that's the majority of cases juvenile courts here are unmarried parents. We made our subject matter jurisdiction challenge, and under the UCCJEA, it's supposed to give docket priority. It's supposed to be resolved before, surprise, surprise, any determination on the merits. What does she do? She proceeds to, to make a determination on the merits. So we file in January of 2012. We raise our challenge in February of 2012. We have a full trial that is ultimately concluded in February of 2013, both on challenging the subject matter jurisdiction and on the merits, which included us sending a custody evaluator and me to Japan, because that's where all the collateral witnesses were. And then the magistrate sat on issuing a decision until April of 2014. Well, <laughs> it was very difficult. We were trying to be, you know, as um, tactful as possible. What we ended up doing was filing certain things to get the attention of the judge in charge to walk down the hall and kick the door and say, WTF, <laughs> okay? Um, in the meantime, dad had filed for a complaint for divorce in Japan. Japan lapped the United States. 
gave him custody. So what we ended up doing is we filed a motion to enforce the Japanese order here, which got everybody's attention. And lo and behold, here comes the magistrate's decision, again, against our guy. So we have to file objections. We get in front of the judge, who is who we wanted to be in front of because she was smart. Not because she agreed with us, but because we knew she knew what she was doing. By the time we got to in front of her on objections, which was May of 14, by the beginning of July of 14, even after having oral arguments on the, on the objections, she had overturned the magistrate, ordered the return of the child. We coupled that with enforcing the Japanese order. She actually ended up issuing essentially um, a capius for mom and ordered the sheriffs to assist dad on a habeas type action to secure the return of the child. And one day after my, my birthday, it was September 21st, I got a text from my, my client with his daughter from Narita Airport in Tokyo, right? 34, 33, 34 months after her abduction. It took us that long to go through this convoluted process. Why do I bring it up again? Nobody knows about this stuff. And when you don't know about it, that's dangerous. The judiciary needs to be educated. We need to be educated. Right? We should designate federal judges in districts that are assigned to hear all Hague cases within the district. They're not going to hear that many. They can do other things. It's not like they're sitting there twiddling their thumbs. But they should have special training. It won't bog down their docket. We should have an accelerated docket. We should do our best to adhere to the six-week mark. That causes a lot of angst to me as a practitioner, trying to get a Hague case from start to finish done in six weeks is a major undertaking. But Europe does it all the time, so it's possible. We need other judicial training at the state level and at the federal level so that the judiciary is identifying these issues and steering them in the direction they need to go. We need to make sure the jurisdictional issues are addressed before substance, not conflated together. It happens all the time, in particularly on the state court level. Who can decide those things and does it require legislation? Decide what things? To assign one judge, make sure everything goes. I think, I think it's legislative, personally. I think Congress needs to do something about it. Um, they have shown that when push comes to shove and the issue becomes big enough, <clears throat> Goldman, right, they'll do something, right? It's a little bit too late, but if it becomes a political issue, which I think it'll continue to become, um, I think it needs to come from legislative action. I think they need to amend the enabling statute that says the federal courts, each federal court shall designate one judge to do it. The state court level is up to the state courts to do it. Um, the, the Ohio Supreme Court could mandate that all part of the judicial training, you know, every judicial officer has to go to, you know, judge college, right? They all have seminars that they need to attend. It's very easy to require the judiciary, especially the domestic and juvenile judiciary, to have some training in this, right? Not so that they can say, I'm an expert, I've had two cases, but they know enough to be dangerous, right? They know enough to go, that smells like a Hague case, right? Attorney training, yeah. Well, I was just wondering, I think the Hague uh, agreement was in effect, the convention was in effect when uh, Adrian Gonzalez was returned to his father in Cuba. Mm -hmm. But why did that become such a mess? Why didn't they invoke that? And Cuba is a signatory. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Easy answer, right? Cuba's not a signatory. And at the time, I mean, re just recently, right? We've just recently relaxed the embargo, right? People are now going to, to Havana again, to, you know, Ricky Ricardo, right? Since <coughs> pre-Kennedy, right? I mean, that, it's been closed. We haven't had any contact with them. That's why. Um, attorney training. District courts, federal, state, we should offer training to our, to our general bar, make it available, things like this. Right? Getting the word out, making sure that people at least understand that this thing is out there. And if you don't know what you're doing, know who to refer to. Right? Doesn't mean me. But knowing that there are a group of people, and I would say in Northeast Ohio, there's probably a handful of law firms and lawyers generally, collectively, that do this type of work well. 
right? Anybody could probably like fumble through it and do it, but to know how to do these types of things and then to counsel your clients and, and make smart decisions, it really is a niche. So that's what I have for you as it relates to this topic. I know I went a little bit over. I could continue talking forever about this thing because it's near and dear to my heart, but questions, comments, anything? I have another question. Uh, when you get a case in, does the case generally start, I guess it depends on uh, the parent left behind or who you're representing, which side. Mm -hmm. But does the case generally start by filing something with the Hague or do you generally start by filing in a court and then citing the Hague Convention? Uh, what I tell people to do when I'm being contacted by somebody overseas, which is, or you know, it, they may happen to physically be here, but it has to do with a child abducted to the United States. Or it could be a person here and they're talking about my kid was just taken to South Africa, what do I do? I tell them to, do, to cover all their bases. I tell them to immediately file a petition for a return in the US Central Authority, in the central authority of the country in which they believe the child is located, and to immediately contact counsel or on their own file a petition for a return in whatever court will accept it. There's a number of reasons for that, two of which are practical. One, the sooner you get on the radar with the central authorities, they're pretty good at following up, right? They constantly contact us, me, by email and by phone to say, hey, we found out this case was filed. How are things going? Do you need any help? Central authorities do a lot other than just accept um, information. They can, they are empowered and required to obtain official statements on and translations of law from the foreign jurisdiction. They, um, they can be used as a, almost like, I don't want to use the term diplomatic, but as a, as a conduit, a channel for getting information back and forth between the two countries. Um, they can be of assistance as far as trying to direct you to other resources, whether it's pro bono counsel, whether it's um, public interest groups, whether it's um, state or federal legislators that may be interested, right? They have a lot of resources, so they tend to act as a clearinghouse. So by getting on their radar fast, that's one thing. Two, when you take a step back and you look at it and you say, and this is something I didn't cover because we didn't have a whole lot of time to talk about the convention itself, there is a built-in quasi-statute of limitations. Not the 16-year thing, but in order for there to be a presumptive return, you have to bring an action, and this is coming from the convention, meaning you have to file a petition for the return, within a year of the removal or the retention. Right? If you file the petition within a year, there is a, there's a presumption that the kid shall be returned. If you file it a year and a day, there's still a strong presumption the kid should be returned, but it's not mandatory anymore. Okay? So the faster you get in, you stop the clock. Right? I'm doing something on it. I'm not just sitting on my hands waiting. The better. Nothing is really going to happen with the central authorities. The thing that we need to do is really file in the United States is you file in court as quickly as possible. Part of the reason for that is that definitely cuts off the one-year tolling, right? Simply filing with the central authority doesn't do it under ICARA. It does do it by filing in a federal or state court. Practice pointer, I would always file in federal court. It's a much more pleasurable place to, to play, less sand throwing. Um, they they uh, don't tolerate things as much, gamesmanship, things of that nature. Um, they're more accessible. Uh, they treat it as an actual legal issue, right? They, don't, they tend to not blur things as much because, let's face it, most federal judges don't deal with familial relations stuff at all, right? Domestic relations courts do. So when, every, when you have one tool and it's a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So that's what DR judges tend to do. Um, so I usually tell people to do all three. But me as a lawyer, the primary, and I give them that responsibility. Go online. You can file a petition with the U.S. Central Authority by fax, by email. 
they make it very easy. That's just to make the argument less likely that you sat on your hands and did nothing. But what you're really concerned about is in the United States is cutting off that one year mark because it can, it can be meaningful. So there's some of these cases where I know of two. One of them was the Simcox case. I wasn't involved in it, but I know the lawyers who were. Uh, one I was involved in where the parents are going through custody litigation in state court for you know, nine, ten months after the removal or retention. In both of the cases, it was a retention issue, meaning mom or dad said, yeah, go, go visit. You have a sick parent or go on vacation, and then they just don't come back, right? And so you have that problem of at what point does it become a retention, right? And usually it boils down to when the one parent says, I ain't coming back, <laughs> right? That's usually by way of, here are some divorce papers, honey, right? <laughs> that's usually what ends up showing the bright line, right? But the longer people sit on those things, even while it's under the year, it starts to cut against them. So really, it's a race to the courthouse. So you're saying that it would be preferable to go to the federal court here as opposed to our New York, New York court, where you might actually get a quick ex parte order of some sort that would be a custody order enforceable in, in the other nation. What would you get out of the federal court here? Uh, let me answer that question, and part of it is... Um, and, and I apologize because we didn't have the ability to go through the finite parts. This um, is a Hague Convention issue. Once an action is commenced under the convention, the court system in the abducted two country is precluded from making determinations on custody. So once a Hague action is filed, if you file the Hague action in a state court, the state court can't render a temporary custody order. If you're the abducting parent or if you're the one behind parent? Whoever. What? Okay. Right? In the federal court system, what you, what you usually ask for and usually get re readily is TROs. Well, then how did your dad in Japan get a custody order? What was the timing? In Japan? Yeah. He did it in Japan. Uh, so the Hague action was filed in the U.S., or it would have been filed in the U.S., okay? So we had a custody action pending in, in, in Franklin County. The, we argued Franklin County lacked subject matter jurisdiction to deal with the underlying custody matter because it wasn't the home state. Remember that that case wasn't a Hague case, right? The home state is always free to adjudicate the merits of a case. So he filed in the home state, and the home state just the machinery just cranks on, right? I'll give you another example. It's currently happening between the United States and Italy, both convention um, countries. It's a bit more complicated. I won't get into it, but as to what the actual issues in dispute are, but suffice to say, mom, dad, kid lived in Italy. Mom brings kid to the United States. Dad files hate convention action in the United States. Prior to dad filing a Hague Convention action in the United States, mom files for temporary custody in juvenile court. She gets an ex parte temporary custody order. As soon as dad files that Hague action, all parenting cases are federally preempted and they're stayed. So nothing can happen. The court can't do anything. And that order, while she's got it and it's here, it doesn't really do much for her. In Italy, sorry, and in Italy, dad continues to go on and get custody orders in Italy because he's saying Italy is the, home, the habitual residence. So Italy's free to do whatever they want. The United States is locked down. Should the left behind parent file here in DR first and then do the Hague? Mm, no. Are you asking what he did? No, I'm suggesting would that be another way to go? Get your custody order first, then get the Hague. You could do it. Part of the potential problem might be is then, yeah, you could do it. You could. You could. But still, then once you have the, the Hague action pending, then the enforceability of the ex parte order gets stayed because it gets federally preempted. You can't like then say, like, oh, I'm going to enforce this order in a DR court to say that I'm allowed to leave the country with the kid because I had an ex parte order when we're fighting about whether or not that ex parte order was valid to begin with. It's very convoluted. <laughs> As you 
well known in domestic relations, the big power question is best interest of the child. You got it. Okay, let's say we actually, after all the legal jockeying, get to a hearing. Who, who, what country's rules of evidence are we going to use? The, habitual, the, the country of habitual residence. Of the what? The country of habitual residence. Okay. So I'll give you the example. Between the United States and Canada, if my wife is Canadian and we have a daughter and we're living in Detroit and my wife goes back home to Toronto to visit her family and says, I'm not coming back, we have, I file a Hague action. The Canadian courts ultimately say, yep, Chris, you're right. The removal was wrongful. The United States has jurisdiction over this kid. Michigan's substantive law would apply. During the proceedings, it would be the, the situs of the Hague action. If they apply. Because under the convention, the rule, well, at least under the ACARA, the rules can be relaxed. Right? You can attach all sorts of hearsay to, p to petitions, and the, the express language of the treaty says that it doesn't have to be authenticated. It's to be considered, and it can be considered without a hearing. Is anybody going to, any parent going to get arrested if they violate something or like an injunction or something? They could. Federal, especially, and that's one of the reasons why we tend to like to file in federal court. DR courts, what, are you going to have a contempt proceeding, right? What are they actually going to do? Right, gets punted. We'll 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 continue this contempt proceeding until you know we get to the end. Federal courts, the judges take their orders and violations of their orders a bit more seriously. Mm -hmm. They don't like it when people give them the finger, and they have federal marshals, <laughs> who I like. I mean, they're nice guys. You go into the federal courthouse, they'll jabber with you. You go across the street to the you know the the justice center, or, you know one lakeside, and they're all crabby, you know. I don't understand um, about being arrested. There are some intersections that are we could talk about at some point um, that people should be aware of. And this is getting a little bit deeper than the scope of what we're talking about. But if you remove a child from the United States in violation of another parent's parenting rights, it's a federal crime. punishable by at least up to one year in prison. Um, so a disincentive for somebody during Hague litigation to kind of say like, well, I'm just going to engage in self-help and take off. <laughs> you may never be able to come back to the United States. Um, so there are, there are these practical questions. Could somebody get arrested? Yeah. The, the, the federal courts, state courts, everybody under the convention, and in particularly under ICARA, they have the authority to enter orders in order to secure the safety of the child, which means the federal court can issue an order. You bring the court, this kid to court, and they can order their surrender to the left-behind parent subject to cer certain orders, right? Like everybody surrenders their passports and things like that. But they do have the authority to do that. I haven't seen it done very much. Most of the time what ends up happening is there's a TRO. Usually it's agreed upon because they're – no, there's really no basis to argue against it, right? Usually, if I'm representing the left-behind parent, there's a request that both the parent and the child's passports are surrendered either to counsel, subject to the federal order, or to the court. Usually, the court doesn't want to hold them, so they usually may counsel hold them. Um, and there's usually also another uh, um, part of that order that I seek, sometimes we don't get, which is prohibiting... The, it's almost like an injunction rather than a TRO, um, preventing the, the abducting parent, for lack of a better term, from trying to seek another passport from a consulate, embassy, et cetera. Because it depends on what countries you're dealing with, right? So for example, Japan, um, a Japanese national can enter the country without a passport because Japan was a closed uh, closed society for 600 plus years until the late 1800s. They have a different family registry. It's called a koseki. And if your name is listed in your family's koseki, you can enter the country based on proving your Japanese citizenship that way. So surrendering your passport, you know, maybe a, meat, a bone with no meat on it, right? But a lot of the countries that people are really worried about 
are the ones that aren't Hague signatories anyway. And so generally, it's pretty easy, whether you're in state or federal court, to get a you know, some sort of relatively strict restriction about um, contact with the kid and, and surrendering of passports and things. So like, people aren't going to say, like, you're going to go to the Syrian embassy and get a passport because you know, you're the dad, right? Most countries of that nature aren't signatories to begin with. The only country in the Middle East, for example, that's a signatory, anybody have an idea? Huh? Israel. Israel's one. What's the only other one? Mm-hmm. Nope. Turkey. That's it. India, legal black hole. Okay? They're not a signatory at all. You want to abduct a kid? Go to India. You'll never get them back. It's a practical reality. It just, it just is. Um, any other questions? Comments? If you think of anything, I know we rushed through this, and part of it's just because of the timing. I said when I said at the beginning I could sit here and talk for hours. I really could. I really like this stuff. Um, feel free to email me. Um, if you didn't put your name on there and you want the articles, both the uh, um, Oxford one, which talks about it's essentially um, we built it off of the uh, hate, the Japanese case, and then that acted as a springboard for the second one which is essentially how bad is the U.S. failing because we were so disgusted with how long it took for the judiciary to recognize and how much education we had to do with them and with everybody else about don't you understand what's going on here? And it's like over their head. It just, they just, they just see nail, hammer, nail, hammer, Nail, hammer, mm. that's what they see. So the two are related, um, and uh, you know, I'm proud of them, but you know, if you want them, just make sure you sign up, I'll get them to you. And um, if you ever have any questions, if any of these things ever cross your desk, um, you can feel free to call us, whether or not you want us involved or not, even if it's just like, hey, I, got an, I have this thing, what do you think? I get a lot of calls from people like that that say, you deal with Hague cases. Do you see any issues here? I get those cases all the time, and not just from Ohio. We get them from California. I got some from Missouri one time. We get them from all over the place. Are the facts and procedure of your Japanese case included in the materials? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you. Hopefully, it wasn't too disjointed. I was trying to cram a lot of information in in a very short period of time. Um, Again, if you have questions about the materials that I provided, let me know. It was a pleasure. Have a great rest of your day. And thanks for letting me talk. Do I need to give, is there a a code or anything that you all need? CLE? No, No, they gave it to you? Okay, good. Thank you. Yes, thank you.